is going to be closing the data gap. Water stewardship, water stewards. Uh, the key to the future. You always have to decide on your title really early. So it has evolved a bit since then. Let's see how these buttons work. So I wanted to start today with this slide. It's by a guy named Gus Benz. I don't know him personally. Like anything else, I learn everything from the internet. But he said, I used to think the top environmental problems were biodiversity, loss, ecosystem collapse, climate change. And he was hoping 30 years of good science could address those problems. He said he was wrong, and the top environmental problems are actually selfish greed, and selfishness, greed, and apathy. And to deal with those, we use spiritual and cultural transformation. And we scientists don't know how to do that. <clears throat> I like to think that Sylvia and I are on the science end. I don't necessarily entirely agree with this, because I do think we still need data and science in order to address some of these problems, or maybe identify and understand them. But I think. To me, what this says is we need more than just science and studies and published work and, and data collection. We need people in, in all angles of advocating for change that, that helps us to do better in the world. So we'll just give a brief outline. We're going to give a quick introduction, who we are, what we do, talk a little bit, uh, a bit about the science that whole rainwater reaches the stream. We're really focused on groundwater and surface water. We're going to go through a few case studies. Um, some challenges and actually some successes and talk about some of the uh, initiatives in terms of stewardship work and their involvement in data collection and, and uh, resource decision making. So <clears throat> who are we? Well, you're looking at the two people that, would, by job description, we are the technical experts for what's called the West Coast region. I'll try to point to that. That's, that's this area in blue, not including the lower mainland. We basically look after uh, Vancouver Island of the Central Coast in Haida Gwaii. And this is the team. So we don't have 100 people working behind us. We oversee 70,000 square kilometers roughly of land, 200 aquifers, some 36,000 wells, some 1,500 watersheds. So if you wonder why we haven't been to your watershed, it's because we've been in the other 1,545. <laughs> I'm the regional hydrologist, so I look after surface water. Again, my job description says I'm supposed to be the technical expert. I feel less and less qualified to be that every day, and the more that I learn. But here's the gist of some of the things that we do. We do uh, flood response, drought response, some water science. The group that I'm in looks after dams and dikes as well. Uh, licensing and some uh, other things that I can't think of right now. <coughs> So on, uh, I'm Sylvia Barroso, as uh, already stated, and on um, the groundwater side, so the groundwater protection program um, in the West Coast region, we uh, have about uh, more than 80 groundwater observation wells. That's part of our observation well network, where we monitor groundwater level and uh, temperature, and in some cases, uh, quality. We do compliance and enforcement of the Water Sustainability Act groundwater protection regulations, working with the well driller and well public water industry and well owners to maintain their wells. Um, and we do science, we work with our partners in governments, other governments, Ministry of Environment, and uh, regionally to undertake groundwater science, so act for mon monitoring water budgets. And, um, and uh, we also provide assistance to water authorizations for groundwater licensing. So we're going to cover a bit of science here. When I take my daughter to a reading time, they always say you have to put on your listening ears. We're going to try and cover a lot of ground in a very short amount of time, so also put on your thinking brains. So some of the stuff has been said before. We're going to say it again just to try and beat it to death. Have here the groundwater surface. We're talking about groundwater surface water interaction over the next few slides. This is the what I like to think of as the famous water cycle that's been talked about before. Um, basically, it's the cycling of water through the atmosphere and back to the earth. As you can see, it goes up into the clouds there, falls down into the streams and lakes and onto the ground, is absorbed into the ground surface, and eventually keeps cycling around. And as people have alluded to, anytime you make some sort of disturbance in there, building a Walmart or something else, obviously, you interrupt that cycle in some form and interrupt those transfers, and you can expect that to propagate throughout the system in some way. We're going to focus in on the stream channel, because groundwater and surface water, this is where they come together. So often the groundwater and surface water are interacting in, in some form, and we simplify it in basically these four diagrams. So on the top left, we've got a gaining stream. That's where, at least conceptually, the groundwater is flowing into the stream. 
Uh, right, we've got a losing stream. Groundwater is flowing from the stream into the aquifer. If the groundwater table is low enough, you have some form of disconnection. In this case, they've illustrated that the, the stream channel is losing water to the aquifer, but through a, an unsaturated zone. And in the bottom right, sort of a neutral condition where water is being exchanged between the aquifer and the stream in some fashion. Um, on any particular system, you can expect this to occur in all its various forms, usually along the length of the stream. The stream tends not to be all gaining or all losing. It'll gain in some reaches, lose in some others. And then as well, it'll change through time. Some places, sorry, sometimes years it'll be gaining, sometimes years it'll be uh, losing. All depends on how the water table is moving. All right, so um, as water scientists, we understand uh, there's no free water. So um, any groundwater pumping is going to uh, be compensated for by change in storage in the aquifer or uh, capture of water that would normally discharge to the stream, capturing that water, or induced recharge, so pumping of water directly from the street, stream channel into the aquifer. Um, in a bedrock aquifer system, we might also have hydraulic connection between the surface water and the groundwater system. So say, for example, a bedrock well pumping in an upland setting might lower and depress the water table and affect stream uh, flow to a nearby spring, which contributes to overland flow and, and stream flow down below, or it can affect the water that is normally recharging within the mountain block or regional flow system and discharging down into that valley bottom on the consolidator sand gravel aquifer. Um, when we look at a real case scenario rather than a, a conceptual diagram, uh, we realize that this uh, the increasing complex complexity of these natural systems. So here's a cross section of Captain River Aquifer uh, construct, uh, made with information from well construction records. So the river is here, um, and you can see that it's a complex layering of systems. And you've got wells at varying depths in different aquifer layers that are more or less connected to the river system. So um, one of the ways that we might uh, understand if there's hydraulic connection or not between surface and groundwater is to look at a hydrograph or the groundwater level change over time. So here's a hydrograph of, um, of a well that is not hydraulically connected to a stream. So it shows within this coastal area we tend to wear rain dominated systems. So we have high, highest groundwater levels in the winter following recharge. And then over the summer or spring and summer period, groundwater levels will naturally decline due to uh, discharge and through pump, uh, the effects of pumping. Following, following fall and winter, you get a rebound of the, the water levels. So here's some uh, information from Couch and River um, first. So we've got the river trace here, and we've got wells, observation wells, and production wells uh, located uh, adjacent to the river. Um, and you can see that the groundwater levels basically mimic uh, very quite closely the surface water levels. So um, we can see there's a strong connection. We can also look at indicators like temperature. So in this region, um, groundwater temperature tends to average about 10 degrees, where surface water will change in temperature over time um, and with peaks in the summer. Um, so here's the river temperature, and you can see that the groundwater temperature also rises uh, depending on the distance of the river from the, of the well from the uh, stream. So uh, another way that we might look at uh, indicators of groundwater uh, surface water connection or hydraulic connectivity is to uh, pump, uh, conduct a pumping test. So a pumping test gives us information about uh, well productivity and also um, about the subsurface conditions. And if uh, surface water, so when a well is pumped, the water level or surrounding it will become depressed and form this cone of depression. And if that cone of depression intercepts a source of recharge, such as a surface water body, then the response of the water level in the well will, will uh, reflect that. So here's a standard uh, pump test of a well that's not hydraulically connected. Um, you can see that uh, over time the drawdown in the well becomes constant and um, it, it draws down at a constant rate over the, the period of the, the pumping test. Um, here's one well that is located uh, in Yubo, adjacent to Couch and Lake. Um, so during the initial phase of the test, the water level drew at a certain rate, and once that cone of depression hit the lake shore, or a source of recharge, then the rate of decline of groundwater levels in the well 
also diminished, reflecting that recharge was occurring. Um, here's a really highly productive well for the city of Duncan, located in that same Couch and River aquifer. Um, and uh, you can see that they were pumping at over 2,000 US gallons per minute. And uh, the well itself is located about 100 meters from the river. And uh, the with drawdown within the well stabilized within the first minute, a minute of pumping. And there was no further drawdown over more than 24 hours of pumping after that. So again, very strong hydraulic connection. Um, we can also uh, prepare models that show um, that or predict interaction between aquifers and surface water. So um, here's for the Couch and River system, um, and it basically shows that along different reaches and different areas, depending on aquifer materials and topographic uh, gradients that drive the system, you can have locations that are naturally gaining, so they're receiving groundwater recharge and naturally or naturally losing um, as a result of the, those conditions. The zones that we have gaining conditions, we note uh, the biologists find that there's congregations of uh, aquatic species like salmon, um, and that just basically highlights the importance of these types of thermal refugia for aquatic habitat and the importance of groundwater to aquatic habitat. And here's a little interesting one from a coastal setting, um, an aquifer or an observation well that we have in Saturn Island, um, which shows a very characteristic. Um, mixed semi-diurnal pattern, which for those of you who do marine research would recognize as tidal influence. So we have uh, that type of uh, groundwater surface water connection as well. So hopefully that hopefully that addresses any that the two are intrinsically connected, which we've known for a long time, but maybe haven't necessarily appreciated in every venue. So. <clears throat> We're going to move to what that means in terms of surface water and surface water flow. So this is a typical storm hydrograph. Now you can hear. Um, on the left side there, these little bars are supposed to represent precipitation of rainstorm over some amount of time. And what this is essentially trying to illustrate here is that the discharge in the river is going to increase as a result of precipitation and then decrease at some point. And they've broken it down into these three components, base flow, through flow, and surface runoff. Surface runoff being the most rapid component Kim spoken about in this uh, talk just before us. So this is your most rapid overland flow, water just running off the landscape right into the stream and forming quite a bulkier storm flow. Uh, through flow is going to be that or quick flow, sometimes called is basically the stuff that moves through the shallow groundwater and makes it to the stream relatively quickly. You can see how it's sort of an increasing component during the storm as the water as the ground becomes saturated. Uh, but this is what we're most interested in our talk, is this base flow, the flow that's supported by the deeper groundwater and, and water out of the aquifer. Basically because we're managing, this, trying to manage the resource, water as a resource, this stuff disappears quite quickly. So if you can, if you can get your hands on that, you can, you can use it, but it comes at the wrong time of year for a lot of things. So <clears throat> the top's cut off here, but it does say, well, let me read the slide over here, what can we expect our streams to do in the absence of precipitation? So on the island, Historically, we can say, well, there's so much water available in winter, who really cares what's in the summer? Um, but what happens in the summer is pretty critical. So now with, with thinking about fish habitat, uh, aquatic health, and that sort of thing, we, we are quite concerned about how streams behave through the summer in the absence of precipitation. All my most critical points are cut off, apparently. So there, there was the number one, two, three, and four here. Conceptually, we're thinking that there's a few different possibilities of how the streams should behave. So once it stops raining, as the summer goes on, what happens to your streams? Do they decline at a constant rate to zero? Do they have some sort of an exponential decline? So the rate of decline is declining. Do they reach some sort of steady state? Or do they have this inexplicable state? It's like a camel. The inexplicable one is most often what we see because we have systems that are allocated in surface water and groundwater. They have reservoir releases. They have um, people building dams or tubing down the river or doing whatever they're going to do. And so instead of following, following some nice natural trend, we have all sorts of things that are, that are confusing the issue. But in the end, this question here says, is, is there an infinite supply? So the Earth is of finite size. Any resource on that Earth must be in finite supply. With water, we have the luxury of the water cycle. So water is taken back up in the atmosphere and recycled back onto the land. But if we took away the precipitation, would we have an endless amount of water in the aquifer to supply us for base flow forever? Yes, no? I don't think so. 
So this is a, a plot of Bonsall Creek. So discharge along here. These are some rainstorms that happen towards the end of the summer. Basically, you can see this one declines down to a, about a steady state and is supported by a few little rain events towards the end of the towards the end of the year. But we see this in a lot of streams where they decline to a point and they never seem to go much lower. But presumably, you would eventually run out of water, like Bonnell Creek. So Bonnell Creek is about halfway between Nanaimo and Parksville, and as you can see, uh, there's no water in it. So it runs dry early in the summer, and it does not have any water into it until late in the fall when there is enough precipitation to cause stream flow in this gravel, nice gravel bed channel. It does have other problems, for those of you who could recognize what this problem is. Um, there is some water, here's under the highway, there's a nice little pool here, but those pools will dry up as the summer goes on. Um, and I will tell you that the problem in this channel is it's a lot of sediment aggregation in the lower river. So what do we have in 2018? <clears throat> this is about four months of precipitation, Victoria, Shemaine, and Sol Falcon. We have essentially zero precipitation, even though there's little storms recorded here. Six millimeters after a long dry spell does very little to overcome your soil moisture deficit. Uh, what we saw in the Shemaine's River during that time was initially a rapid decline and a sort of almost what seems to be a, a what could be an asymptotic to a steady state, but again, even in the lower end, we're still seeing a slight decline. We could expect to see this river go dry. Again, this one is sort of confused because there are groundwater licenses, there are surface water licenses, and there are reservoir releases, and there are some very large pumping systems. There are also agricultural licenses that offer return flow. There's diversion systems that take water from the river but put it back in. So these are all things that confuse a nice simple water balance. But here's the zero level, and this is about 100 liters a second, and the Shemanus is not a small system. 100 liters a second is a very little amount of water to have at the end of the summer. Contrast that with Nile Creek. Nile Creek's a little ways north of here in the bustling metropolis of, I think, Bowser. Um, during that same period, it has the same flow all summer long. It does not seem to care. Uh, it sits on quite a porous formation, and you have these little um, oscillations in here, which right now we tend to believe are basically the vegetation using the water, depressing the water table and, and causing these fluctuations in the uh, groundwater flow into the river. But <clears throat> Will it continue like this forever? If it never rained again, would you would Nile Creek flow continuously forever? I don't think so. Um, this goes back to what a lot of people have talked about. Mostly today, I think you see this is just say humans and rivers a little bit cut off, but the idea of all our activities on the land base are going to have some sort of impact. We have done a lot of this uh, yesterday. Dave Derrick's organization down there in the U.S. Army Corps—they've straightened a lot of rivers, haven't they? It's not going to. Not many of us, most of the farmers and local. Yeah, locally straight. But we did some. There you go. <laughs> We've done quite a bit of this sort of thing. We've done a lot of this sort of thing, and you, and you can't do that without having an, some sort of impact. Oh, it's still me. So what we brought is we have the Water Sustainability Act, which uh, was introduced in 2016, and we're just going to race through a few things here to highlight some of the, the, the things that the Water Sustainability Act did. The Old Water Act was over 100 years old, and um, was really not necessarily for the purpose of conservation or stewardship. It was nicely made, mainly designed to resolve conflicts in rainwater. water. Um, with the new Water Act, we have the addition of groundwater licensing, uh, non-domestic groundwater licensing. We have this thing called environmental flow needs, and at least at some point in the future, there'll be things called sustainability plans and government options. They're being developed in regulation, so they don't really exist yet. Um, groundwater licensing has been a big step forward, so. Hopefully you all appreciated all the data that Sylvia showed you that groundwater and surface water are one resource. So if we, tr before with the Water Act we were only licensing surface water, now we can license the non-domestic groundwater. It does give us a uh, much better record of groundwater use, it gives us some powers of regulation, and it recognizes aquifers as an entity under the Water Sustainability Act, and recognizes that hydraulic connection. So from a resource management perspective, it's, it's big. We couldn't really manage groundwater. Um, environmental flow needs is a big one. There was really nothing in the Water Act before that spoke to aquatic ecosystems, um, compensation for damage, these sorts of things. So there were a few things around pollution. So environmental flow needs are designed, let's, let's read this together, to, to preserve the volume and time and flow required for the proper function of aquatic ecosystems of the stream. It has to be, or is, 
it's strongly recommend to be considered in decisions related to water licensing and connected aquifers. And then we have another thing called the critical environmental flow threshold. So the volume of water in a stream below which you can expect, what is it called, significant or irreversible harm to the aquatic ecosystem or the stream. And we put down here is the biological red line for fish. So this is a, a nice um, idea in theory. It is very difficult in practice. Uh, one reason is the idea of significant harm is subjective. So one person's idea of significant harm is different from another. So <clears throat> often from a provincial regulatory perspective, we are looking at what will stand up in court. And it's difficult to say exactly what significant harm is. We, we struggle with debating this all the time. Irreversible harm is another one that's quite tricky because irreversible harm is a significant collapse in a fish population. Until the fish population collapses, you don't know it's going to collapse. So uh, the ups and downs in the fish population, you, we, we can sort of estimate the threshold below which we think all the fish are going to die, but until all the fish die, we won't know that we were right. So it's, it's, it's a very tricky thing to work with. Uh, what does EFN essentially mean, at least to us? I would say it reserves and prioritizes water for aquatic function. So whereas before, um, all the water in the stream would be available for licensing, although everybody saw it a little bit differently. Some water managers kept more water back, some did. This gives the ecosystem some standing under the act. But we have a lot of challenges up here. So, you know, that critical environmental flow threshold that I mentioned, somebody has to figure out what that is. And that flow is different at all points in the system. It's different on different systems. It's different for different species. It's an extremely challenging thing to address. And you could, you could put a whole team of people on this to work endlessly on it. And we, we have done that. We've hired one person. <laughs> um, so it's a question of how much water is reserved. How, how much do you actually keep back for fish? And is that water even available in the stream now? We've been licensing since the late 1800s. And in 2016, we started recognizing the ecological function. Um, there's also the question of flow naturalization. So most records of hydrometric data don't predate allocation. They don't predate um, people mucking about in a river. So what was the natural flow? What was the natural ecosystem function out there? I don't know. Um, and then again, the data to support this. So it's very labor intensive to collect data. This will lead into our whole stewardship thing later. We now have to consider groundwater into it, and all this is incorporated into our resource management decisions and our, our regulatory actions as well. Okay, so now we've got the concepts going. We'll, we'll do one uh, little case study about uh, a basin where groundwater and surface water interaction is really important. Um, it's in the Coquisila River watershed, which is uh, a watershed located um, just south of Duncan. Duncan is here. Uh, the watershed is mostly privately managed forest lands, about 80% of the watershed. And then all of this uh, concentration of groundwater use, these dots, and, um, and development is in the lower third of the watershed. Um, it's historically been a really important uh, watershed or river for uh, anadromous species, trout, salmon. Uh, it's in, uh, spiritually and um, economically important to the local First Nations and community. And um, for the last few decades, several decades, there's been issues with respect to low flows in the stream and high water temperatures. Uh, so uh, here's a species periodicity chart, which shows um, the different life stages of different salmonid species within the Coxala system. And, um, some, and you can see that for some species like Chinook and Coho um, and the trout, they uh, inhabit the, species, the stream during this yellow period, which is the low flow period. So they uh, are reliant upon um, flows within the stream for rearing and juvenile migration at that stage. Um, in comparison to chum, which are already out of the system at that stage, and so maybe they might not be as impacted. So what do we look at? Uh, what do we see in terms of escapement numbers? Um, just as an example here, um, we have Chinook, a traditional population uh, averaging around 400 uh, odd fish, and the latest count in 2006 showed eight fish in the system. So something um, is going on. Uh, they didn't count them that day. And then here's some chum, chum escapement numbers. So uh, although the latest count in 2015 had 
possibly decline from historic numbers, they're still not as uh, detrimentally impacted in comparison to other escapement or other uh, species that we're seeing. So um, this is the comparison of the mean discharge in August within the stream compared to water usage or water demand on the system. So the blue representing surface water demand, the green is groundwater, and this is red as a total. So the, um, in 1980, recognizing that there were problems with the Coca-Cola system, uh, they discontinued issuing any surface water licenses. Since that time, the number of wells developed in the, in the basin increased uh, exponentially, such that current ground of total water demand on the system has essentially doubled um, past at the point which they had already said um, that there were problems occurring. Who's using the water? Um, it's mainly for agriculture and a smaller amount for industry. And when we think about agricultural water demand, especially for irrigation, that tends to be focused within the dry season um, when we're already having problems with uh, naturalized growth. Um, residential water use is obviously a much smaller proportion. And so uh, when we're thinking about groundwater and surface water interaction, we think about the hydraulic connection, we could conservatively estimate that. Um, that all the groundwater wells are hydraulic connected. So there's about 1,200 wells in the basin, about 850 wells that are located within a kilometer of the stream. Um, more recently, we've done some detailed work on, and analysis of the subsurface lithology and show, basically shows that what we in that conservative estimate is true, that all of the, the wells from the great majority are hydraulically connected. Um, in terms of flows in the river, um, since 2015 or earlier, but especially in 2015, 2017, 2018, um, very, very low flows, historic low flows in the river. Um, last year we had a period um, by which uh, the critical environmental flow threshold is set as 180 liters per second. Um, it went below that and was actually below 150 liters per second for almost a month period until the rain uh, started in early September. So what can we do um, with these new tools under the Water Act, uh, Water Sustainability Act? Um, we, if in a, in a case where we're thinking that the environment is, is threatened, um, we have the ability to issue these temporary protection orders. Um, there's a couple different options. A fish population protection order allows us to regulate the rate, timing, or type of water use from the stream. And that would actually be preferential to us because we could say uh, regulate users uh, that are located closer to the stream or the big big ticket users and, and try to get more water flow back into the system um, in comparison to a critical environmental flow protection order which would have to rely on that first in time first in right principle um, but for the fish population protection order there's a greater burden of proof before we can move on that so that's a, a challenge and so what would happen if we were to actually turn people off? Well, we did an economic analysis of economic in impacts. And so for that one month August uh, shutdown, it could have an economic impact of over $4 million on the local farming community, um, because those would be preferentially um, impacted by um, reducing water use. And those impacts could be felt not only um, within the current year, but in subsequent years. So say, for example, of irrigated crops, um, uh, orchards, binary, uh, vineyards, they could lose part of their, their stock or um, in terms of livestock, they might, you know, what are they going to do in terms of water, uh, to water the animals they might have to cull or relocate um, some of their herds. And then, how to this within um, the, the difficulties that we face in terms of where are we getting the data that's helping us to analyze what's happening in that system. And basically, we had uh, two surface water monitoring stations that bracketed the, the reach uh, over which we saw the greatest decline in, in flows, and we knew that there was the greatest surface and groundwater use, um, but we didn't have, um, we obviously, ha we didn't have any groundwater monitoring within the basin, because uh, previous to this, the groundwater um, ob observational network had focused we didn't have this focus on integrated management of the surface and groundwater. So, recognizing this, we've established two new observation wells within the basin and we hope to construct two more. So, hopefully we're impressing on you the, the managing one resource and the challenges of managing that resource in, in systems like the Coastal. So, talk a little bit about the role of the province that's 
not just ourselves, but other people involved in the decision-making process, informing decisions, making decisions. Um, we're part of the resource stewardship sector, in this case our resource is water. Uh, under the Water Sustainability Act, we manage water allocations, so licenses, that includes dams as well, storage licenses. Uh, the other thing is works in about a stream, for those of you who aren't familiar with it. If you ever want to do any work in or next to a stream, you need permission, you need a, a permit from the province. Um, we also enforce the Water Sustainability Act, so situations where people take water without a permit, store water without a permit, or do works in an about the stream without a permit, we have penalties for that, and we, we do the work, technical work related to that. Um, and then these things called water reserves, so reserves for things like agriculture, First Nations, there's a, there's a big bit, I should say business, there's, a, there's a, a lot of work going into figuring out in terms of treaty negotiations how much water is, is, should be left over for First Nations. And here's a good example of it, so something like this has a license, it's a structure, and it's taking water, and it's using water, so both an allocation and a works issue. Um, just to try and impress on you the complicated nature of decision making, if you are familiar with the vacation destination of the Okanagan, a uh, city like Kelowna gets most of its water from Mission Creek, it's got a number of large water purveyors, all those water purveyors hold a license for distribution of water to their clients in the Kelowna area. So out of the Penticton office where the water manager sits, they might make a decision here on Mission Creek, and it may only be a small license. But the Okanagan Basin here is part of, obviously, the larger Columbia system, and you think if uh, all of these little tributaries, both you know, in Canada and all the way down through the U.S. and many of these states, and I don't know how the Americans make those, their decisions down there. Um, I don't even know how the decisions are made on this side of the basin. But how do all those little decisions add up so what's going to be happening as you progress downstream on the club. Um, and our, in order to understand that, you're going to need quite an expensive connected network of, of data and understanding of relationships in order to manage a source like this. And this, this happens on big and small systems, the idea of, of cumulative impacts of big and small decisions. So what do we need for better resource decision making? Well, I would say a better understanding leads to better management. Um, our first step, at least in our view, is, is the raw data. So you collect the data in order to understand the process, and the more data you collect and the better you understand the process, the more you understand the variability and the uncertainty. So a lot of people have talked about climate change. Climate change has a lot of uncertainty. We have reasonable historic records dating back, you know, tens of years, maybe up to 60, 80 years, but in terms of a changing climate, in terms of long-term climate cycles, in terms of some of the variability that's inherent in those variable, in, the, in those sorts of variables and that sort of data, it doesn't always do us a whole lot of good in terms of understanding all the variability. You add to that the uncertainty of what the climate is going to look like in the future, and you can, in some cases, just disregard your historic data and try to anticipate what's going to happen. But the, you know, on a large scale, there is a lot of work being done on this side. So on the data side, uh, the province has been doing some, some good things. So uh, we have a lot of data tools. These are all sorts of data sources that the province maintains in a way of, of collecting, storing, and, and disseminating data for your use, for the use of people who make decisions, for the people who inform decisions. Um, one that was mentioned earlier, the EMS system, the Environmental Management System, that stores a lot of water quality data. And the new one that we quite like is this real-time water data system. So uh, it allows us to, it, it, it's provided us a database with which we can store uh, groundwater, surface water, snow data is in there now, and water quality data is supposed to appear in there at some point. Uh, it's run on this Aquarius web portal, the Aquarius system. So this is what it looks like right now. Anybody can go on the web page and click on it and get data from any of these points. Um, make the dots big enough, and it looks like we have fantastic coverage in southeast Vancouver Island there. Um, but it's all available, all available for download. If you click on it, there's a little bit cut off here, but there's options on the side, there's drop downs on the top, there's various chart options. You can customize these charts and view the data in any which way you want. And this is something that we're working on in terms of getting as much data as we can in here to make it available for people to, to use. So we want to make the data publicly available. Uh, another thing that we have going on is the, at least on the west coast, so for those people who aren't on the islands, something you can dream of having in your region. Uh, they do have something like this at Camloops too, but this is our drought information portal, so we've identified a number of watersheds that are 
uh, at risk for one reason or another. And this summarizes the drought level, so that's an indication of how much conservation we're trying to encourage in the water users in that basin. And it also has these little points here, things you can click on to view the data from that basin. And it's the data generally that we're using to support our, our assessment of drought. Um, in our work as, as technical people, we love data and we would love to have more data. So we sort of compiled this chart that shows you all the different kinds of data that we, we might be using in any particular decision or project or something else. And, and some indication of, of the people up here who might be collecting. So federal government, provincial up here, we've got Water Survey of Canada, some provincial government staff, local government, uh, First Nations NGOs, water users, there's also industry, academia, all those sorts of things. The green ones are generally the ones that are available, publicly collected data by publicly paid people and made available on public systems and databases. Data that is, is sometimes available, but not always. And that data that is not usually available and we don't necessarily know about. Um, like I said, more data, better understanding, better decisions. If we could, if we could get all this data available, especially if we could make it available all in one place, would go a long way to helping us figure out how to do things. Um, and the province recently introduced this. It's the, as it say at the top there, share your water data, water quality, groundwater, I think, and surface water. There's a little questionnaire stand here you click on, but we're looking to collect or have submit. People submit their continuous data. So you can now go to a web page and fill out a form to, to submit data for the, to the province to be included in our, in our databases. Okay, so um, this is a, a little bit more of an uplifting uh, case study. <laughs> I'm talking about the value and, and importance of community monitoring and involvement in, in ensuring success of uh, a study. So uh, it's also in the island water budget. Um, and looking at um, the involvement of the community there. So Salt Spring Island is uh, large to the southern Gulf Islands. Um, it has uh, most of the surface water, the main surface water bodies on the island are at carrying capacity now. There's uh, limited groundwater, they have fractured bedrock aquifers. Um, there are a lot of development pressures on the island, and um, but simultaneously there's a huge uh, community of engaged individuals that want to contribute to um, their community and uh, get involved in science. So um, we undertook a water budget study on the island to try to look at the primary and the groundwater availability and uh, involved a range of different partners. Um, the project was undertaken in a um, two year period. So the first year was uh, for mapping and data collection phase. Um, we engaged um, critical partners to provide data that could be fed into the water budget and the second phase of the study in the second year. So for example, Ministry of Agriculture undertook um, agricultural water demand estimates um, over the first year and that was really important to add into um, the, the water balance. Um, so this is an uh, equation that represents basically a water budget is a, a balance of the inputs and outputs within the water cycle. Um, on the Salt Spring Island, because it is an island system, essentially all of the water that's available for ecological or human use comes from precipitation that is received within the footprint of the island. Um, and then from that receipt, then it gets divvied up into uh, different components. Um, so evapotranspiration, um, the uh, groundwater pumping, so we have really good data. Um, the Islands Trust and uh, Salt Spring Island Water Protection Alliance um, worked with the community to gather information on water demand and usage, um, and that was really uh, useful to have. Um, um, one of the things that was uh, difficult to quantify and ended up being a big source of error within the budget, the water budget, was this uh, groundwater outflow or base flow component out to sort of streams. Um, but bas basically, the success of the project. Um, partly was to mobilize the community and also to see how the different data sets could be captured from different sources. So when we started out, um, you know, problem, provincially we had these three uh, groundwater observation models um, present with uh, groundwater level monitoring. Um, through the data collection initiatives, through the water, um, water Protection Alliance staff and a dedicated staff, and so we were able to gather information on groundwater levels and water usage from different purveyors. Um, and then uh, we undertook some funding. Islands Trust uh, took the lead in got funding from the Real Estate Foundation of BC, and we were able to establish 10 new community 
uh, observation wells using existing wells on the, on the island. Um, and then now, more recently, um, the Freshwater Preservation Society are developing and engaging local community in monitoring to try to develop a freshwater catalog, which would basically be um, a catalog of information or, or uh, scientific data from the different water systems. Um, provincial networks, I mean, we have, we have some really uh, great data, um, but they can be costly to install and maintain. So um, one observation well could cost us maybe fifteen to twenty thousand dollars each to install and about eight thousand dollars to uh, equip. Um, they're typically purpose built and they would be established for long term data sets in, in um, trying to, to develop those long term data. Um, we have dedicated staff and we provide that data publicly. So what about those community uh, data data or monitoring networks? Well, they can often be a lot more economical. So for example, with the community monitoring network on Salt Spring, um, because they used existing infra infrastructure, um, they cost maybe about $1,000 to establish a station. They can be uh, flexible. Um, if you find that the monitoring is no longer useful at that site, you could redeploy your equipment and move it to something else, or you could do short-term, more high-intensity data collection in one area for specific studies. Um, one thing that I think that is really we want to plug is that um, the, those data collection standards uh, and training really improve the value of the data for um, use. So ensuring that the people that are engaged in collecting it have the information they need to be able to undertake quality assurance, quality control, um, and that we ensure that when those efforts are made, that, that community energy gets mobilized by making that data available for scientific use. We're almost done. If you're still paying attention. I put this slide back up, but this time I added a picture. So again, just to impress it, it's that raw data, that process knowledge, that variability and certainty. So with the Salisbury Island case, the involvement of the community made a huge difference in terms of, of the outcomes of the project and the understanding in terms of, of the resource. So again, that citizen science, that public data, and the, and the data availability aspects. So I just want to talk very briefly about what makes good data, because it's one thing to collect data, it's another thing to collect data that's actually useful and good. So, I summed it up as that continuous, persistent, and consistent. It's best to have frequent measurements. It's great, even better if they're long term, and also it's essential that they're in some way standardized. So we do have the Resource Inventory Standards Committee. Risk, the standards are recently updated. It's a, it's a great volume. You can download it and read it at your leisure. It puts almost everybody to sleep. Um, but it does give us like a defense, defensible quality assurance, quality control process. And if you follow it, it, it uh, basically shows you how to document your data and produce the metadata that supports it. So in 10 years or 100 years or something, somebody goes to download the data and collects it. If they know how it was collected, if they know the standard it was collected to, they know how to use it. So we want, we want good data. Um, the advantages of local data, Sylvia went over this, it's very labor intensive to collect data. So for, for me to go out and collect surface water data, that's all I'm going to be doing. And, Collected, so spent so much time in the field, I know I should spend some time in the office, but we can't be everywhere in all 1,500 watersheds or on all 36,000 aquifers. So having the involvement of community members gives us that labor force that can address those, those data gaps in a way that we just are not capable of doing. But we can provide uh, the expertise, the training, sometimes the equipment in order to actually undertake the work. It gives you this, this local knowledge and, and commitment and passion and engagement. So I, I find, you know, for Sylvia and myself, we, we have a passion about our science because we paid a lot of money to get educated in it and we've spent many years working in it and we really enjoy it and we like doing good work. Um, I think there's a certain passion that comes from people who are very interested, connected to the land base, who live on the land base and have an interest in, in doing good things for the place that they live in um, rather than the alternative. Uh, improving the spatial resolution, that's sort of a no-brainer, we get more data. The other thing is that, that presence on the land base. Um, and that we think about a little bit as, as sort of a, um, a knowledge transfer thing. People out there looking at the rivers, looking at the trees, looking at whatever it is, and thinking about what's there today, thinking about what used to be there, and thinking about what may or may not be there tomorrow. 
and that if something does happen, there will be somebody there who notices, much like um, Bruce Coburn said, if a tree falls in the forest. <clears throat> like this tree here. <laughs> Um, so some of our existing partnerships, this is our, our home stretch here. Uh, Sylvia talked about the Salt Spring Island thing. We've, we've had some surface water partnerships. Uh, it's collaborative monitoring where we've provided some training. We've shared resources. I've, I've shared some equipment we have that is generally just lying around. And we got some of the staff resources from some of the stewardship groups. And this sharing of expertise. So um, undertaking these investigations can be complicated. We can hopefully cover the complicated part and leave you guys with the simple part. That's what I like to think. So here's one has some Creek, Regional District of Nanaimo. Wherever Julie is sitting instrumental in this one. Um, Fisheries and Oceans Canada. Not you, Nick, but someone much different. <laughs> uh, Ministry of Forests, Lands, and so on. That's, that's myself. And some very uh, generous landowners adjacent to the stream who, who provided us access. So. You can sort of see it up here. There's a very expensive hydrometric station. It's got a, a sensor in the river and a bunch of other sensors on it. We've got our staff cages up here. You can see here it is underwater at flood. And some of our staff and, and uh, interns undertaking a very dangerous discharge measurement. So we tend to undertake some of this stuff that's a little more tricky, and we can uh, farm the rest out to the, the local people. Unless you guys want to do the dangerous work, but it's OK, too, as long as I'm not liable. Um, French Creek, this is also the RDM. Uh, same sort of partnerships, but the Friends of French Creek have gone a long way on this. So uh, we did train them up on the use of the flow tracker. We got them out there, they've been out there gauging, they take staff gauge readings, they keep an eye on the system, they, they send us emails to let us know what's going on. Um, saves us all those trips out there. They, they can use an instrument that would otherwise be gathering dust in our, in our warehouse. Um, and leave me to do the great office work. Um, let's deal with San Juan River. I, I wanted to put this one in there because this was a partnership with the uh, Apache Duck First Nation who are uh, in Port Renfrew. So Fisheries and Oceans, they provided the equipment. Here's the, the station on an old bridge uh, pier. Uh, Flimro, we provide the technical expertise and Apache Duck does some of the monitoring, some of the work out there. They, they use the data a lot for their fish swims and fish inventories. And uh, they have had a lot to say about how great it is to have real-time uh, data that comes into it instantly. And also the, the San Juan Stewardship Roundtable is a big part of this in terms of funding and advocacy, which is a group that includes uh, all the timber companies in the basin, um, all the other stakeholders, landowners, and everything else. And you may recognize this fellow keeping a, a very stern watch on his staff as Pete Law. He didn't bring his buns that day, but... <laughs> Read that as you will. So, many staff there, there did two flow trackers. As this, those who were there yesterday can see that they are taking very delicate care of some $30,000 worth of high quality instrumentation. Um, we provided them training one day. They came out on the Englishman River and we showed them how to use it. And uh, so, the, the people who have been trained, we kind of accept that they will trade the instruments between them. And, basically make use of them to take measurements. And the only thing is we like to see is that they submit those measurements to us for inclusion in the database so that we can make them available to everybody else. Um, there are a number of others, British Columbia Conservation Foundation, we've done quite a lot of work with them. They've, again, great sharing. Many Bay have had Enhancement Society, BC Parks, and, and some, other, some other groups all now cut off on this slide. But great opportunities for us, and I'm hoping great opportunities for them. Uh, one we wanted to highlight this, I think Julie put up this slide, but um, MOE has a water quality monitoring network. You look at all these slides, or all these sites, MOE and their water quality staff has oscillated between about one or two people who does the actual water quality sampling. And if you could imagine how much time it would take for one or two people to manage all these sites, it would be staggering. So the fact that you can involve all these different groups up here to collect all this data is, is just incredible. Value there is almost, we can't measure it, but I'll say it's almost a measure. <laughs> so we'll leave you with this one. We have, I think, I hope at least, tried to impress all these things on this thing, and, and I'm sure there's one in every crowd. <laughs> I think we left time for discussion or questions, did we?